There's 27 different types of ejaculant in the game, <laughs> <laughs> including feathers, apology, and tears. <laughs> The, the feathers are because you can eat birds with your butt. <laughs> um. I'm Richard Peterson. I'm from Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, Evan Greenwood, also South Africa, Cape Town. Worked in General Johnston Bro Force. John had three months until the reunion to turn his life around. First, he needed to clean up. Genital Jousting's very first form was a drawing pasted on a wall um, a, with the idea of it was, you know, it, it seemed revolutionary at the time of um, four penises coupled up like a sort of uh, car crash. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and I guess I was convinced that that was a good idea. But it didn't, it didn't in fact happen as a successful prototype for until quite a few years after that. Yeah, I think the, the, I think the space where that sort of drawing came out of was a larger conversation we were having in mm. the office where um, I was sort of like, I'd come out of like a boy school that was quite toxic, I guess. And I was trying to like deal with all of my feelings around that and like, like sexual repression and stuff. And like was just getting really interested in the idea of like, um, seeing penises touch and how that was like so hidden in the media and like just not something you saw very often and I kind of made this prototype mm. as a joke and then just found it like it was called Wang Commander which was like a soccer game sort of where you have a bunch of floppy flaccid penises rolling mm. and touching each other and I just found that like a very engaging sight and I found it very interesting how people reacted in mm. public space when they played this how men interacted when they're playing this together, friends mm. or couples. It was on this projector and there's like four controllers or eight controllers and, and people are playing there. And everyone had kind of gone outside to talk and have coffee and there's drinks outside. And there were, I think, four women that stayed behind and they carried on laughing. And it, it wasn't, that wasn't the result I expected. And so I, I, I guess I had, I would have anticipated that the woman would be put off by this idea and mm. that the men would, be there kind of, you know, hogging the controllers. And it, it kind of, the women were laughing louder for longer. And so in, in my mind, there, there's something there, there's something curious about that, yeah. right? So Evan made the original prototype in Berlin, uh, mm -hmm. along with Martin Cavalli. They had no um, like game loop or no, no, no like scoring system, mm. which was really interesting. Mm. And when you, you put it in front of people, they assumed that the goal was to penetrate and not to be penetrated. Yeah. Right. Um, and we were like, that's very interesting. Mm. Uh, huh. So they decided to put a score system in. This was before I came on, I think. And mm. you tried, uh, what if you get a point for penetrating, a point for being penetrated and two points for both? Yeah but you don't ever explain that to anyone. Mm. So people have to figure out why they're losing. Mm. And it goes from this moment, especially with sort of a, a group of like more like bro-ish people mm. being like, hey, get away from my butthole to being mm. like, Larry, I need you inside me right now, shouting <laughs> this across a room, mm -hmm. which is quite special. Mm -hmm. <laughs> every, every now and then some, some guy who resists that urge and decides the rule of the game is to lose, uh, right. which is, you know, he, he's having to, to deal with that, I guess, and other people having a better time. John needed to shower and wash off the sweaty stink of desperate sadness. I think the, the story evolved um, from just uh, like an idea of maybe some sort of goat simulator, Stanley Parable-esque, like kind of sandbox, towards something that was more meaningful and, and, and kind of did have that, that uh, did get to contextualize some of the uh, concerns we were having with it. So we, we, we made, when we made the multiplayer mode, it had been very like sexual, but then we kind of mm. wanted to explore other aspects mm. of like romance between penises. Mm. So we did a Valentine's Day update, which mm. was... Mm. Um, I, th I think there was penetration, but two, two players going on dates together? Yeah, the, goal, there was no, the goals were to like have these lovely dates together mm. and like this rose picking where you have to go through a bed of roses and pick them by <laughs> impaling the roses on your shaft. So once again, very abject. Yeah. And from that we found this like small vignette format where it sort of cuts between these scenes. Mm. And we decided to go back to that and explore it more. Evan was making these just strange scenes where, I don't know what possessed you, but I'd come downstairs and there'd be 
a penis sitting at a computer with like a waste basket full of like tissues. <laughs> and it had no context for the game they were making. Yeah, uh, there'd just be a sausage on the screen oh, yeah. as well. Which was at, at that stage a stand-in for pornography. Right. Oh, really? <laughs> Uh, that you'd just be able to touch the, the, the button on the computer and scroll through an endless series of different uh, cooked sausages. <laughs> so the first one starts with you basically going to work and deciding you need to get a promotion and then getting the promotion and deciding that because you have this promotion you can now like, ask the person of your dreams out. So you burst into a meeting <laughs> that they are like involved in and just ask them out. Yeah. And then, out of like fear, they basically say yes. It's implied that you're asking Barbara out at this point, and, it's a, and you know that she's a colleague, and you kind of realize that you probably shouldn't ask her out during a boardroom meeting, and she's also the only woman in the meeting. It's like really like, this is like, and it's all, but that's all like kind of, you know, subtext. Like it's clearly just like for the player, if you're not thinking about it, there's just this goal of to bump into Barbara. Right. And which means climbing across the table and nudging her. This was the, in particular a scene where we agonized over it and we didn't know where, where to draw that line. Right. Um, and it, there's lots of bits like that, but it becomes, you know, as the story progresses, it becomes more clear that that's the kind of thing that's going on. John tried to act as suave as possible and listen to Barbara talk business. He didn't want to blow his chances at long-term love and short-term sex. I mean, it's a very physics-driven game. So every door that opens is you're bumping it with physics. You know, there's lots of objects that are kind of falling around, falling off, and you're knocking things over. It's, it's very interesting uh, trying to figure out how the world of like the like user interaction design of uh -huh. a penis in a world basically right. like what how many buttons you can have on a keyboard like how you open a door. A lot of that got determined in the multiplayer mode, uh, where two large penis, like testicles would make it hard to penetrate because you'd have to be avoiding these, these unwieldy uh, testicles. In the multiplayer mode, uh, penises, peni, start uh, quite short, and as they score points by being penetrated and penetrating, uh, they grow longer. But at the smallest, kind of most chub-like size, the testicles couldn't be so out of proportion that it, it looked completely ridiculous. The, the testicles also add a certain amount of drag, um, so there's, there's kind of physics to do with that and, and would need to roll out away from the asshole when the, it was being presented uh, or, or, or for that matter when the penis was reversing um, so that it could reverse onto another. another. John's new purchases were on the way to his apartment. All he had to do was invite a date over. One look at all his stuff and they'd be overwhelmed with sexual desire. John, the main character, gets his lowest moment in the game. Um, he's had all these nightmares, he's been rejected, he's kind of realized that maybe he's, he's done bad, like he's, he's, not on a, he's not been on a good path. And he's had this recurring character, uh, Sam, um, throughout the throughout the game, which has just been in moments where Sam has shown some concern, and in response, John has been like, "Why are you being such a softy?" Um, but Sam comes to help John while John is lying in a park, being attacked by penguins, uh, sorry, by swans. By swans. <laughs> But at that point, the, the game says, do you want, you know, pick up another controller? And it's, it's suggesting that you should, in fact, ask a friend in the real world to come help you finish the game. And, and then from then on, the, the game kind of becomes in, kind of increasingly positive and then a little meditative, uh, where Sam gets to kind of talk maybe about his philosophy, which is like, oh, final kind of opportunity to uh, kind of say what we've really been thinking the uh, entire time. I think it's a really nice trick to, I mean, for anyone that actually got their friend to play it, because it is more fun together. It always was more fun together. John's amazing and he, he really helped us and, and shaped. Uh, John was incredible. Yeah. His, his sort of theory about about what, what, are, what are some of the worst aspects of toxic masculinity that we'd want to at least uh, portray um, and, and that using another person as a means to an end um, was, was a, th a thing that uh, being so concerned about your own attainment and success and goals and not 
about you know, supporting other people is like a horrible side of, of what can be seen as masculinity. And, and he kind of he thought that that was like an approach we could take that would, would be doable um, and would also have an have a important message. What we wanted, ideally, and we, we, we can't really tell if we succeeded in this, uh, was to convince someone who could have, been, could have harbored some toxic masculinity themselves that we were uh, like friends of theirs, that, you know, that they, we'd be telling jokes that uh, would be uh, crass and, and it would be funny and we'd be trying to feel like the game wasn't trying to convince anyone of a particular stance. And, and then at some point we'd, we'd have to kind of flip it on it. We'd be, well, we'd almost earn a trust through that, which we'd then kind of burn by saying, by, by particularly towards the end of the game, kind of showing what we felt was uh, a better uh, kind of masculinity. But we, we couldn't just do that and make the game about that. Even, even set, talking about toxic masculinity right now is, is kind of a problem in the case, in, in the sense that someone who feels that's like a triggering term is, is gonna then be like, well, I'm definitely not gonna have my opinion changed through a, a video game. Yeah, we, we didn't wanna make a game that like outwardly says, hey, it, it'll, change your mind about toxic masculinity because you can't change someone's mind about toxic masculinity if you've uh, already told them that that's what you're <laughs> going to do. And that, that's kind of terrifying in itself because we're saying, okay, we're, this is up our sleeve, we're, we're not going to reveal it. Um, and we're also going to hope that the, peop you know, the people whose opinions we really care about kind of get it. And it doesn't appear like we're just a bunch of douchebags making a huge fart joke at the expense of uh, gay sex. Broforce in its own way is also an exploration of masculinity. Um, in that case, uh, the masculinity is kind of played for laughs by making it a completely absurd and extreme. I, yeah. I think another interesting point that Robbie makes and he made in one of his talks is how we have this long lineage of like this big problem of like overrepresentation of men in video games, but in actual fact, there's no representation of men in video games. Like there's no actual representation of like real men like struggling with real male problems. It's all this like hero attainment fantasies or yeah. success fantasies, which isn't really. I mean, it's so much of video games. I think so much of, in, in a way, some damage that video games does is that you can solve your problem just by doing kind of something simple and repetitive and you can in some cases get the girl in some cases you'll get esteem and fame just by doing this one thing that has like in fact quite a trivial solution that's like got to be really frustrating right like like in real life then all of our dreams and hopes and all the things that actually give us like health and uh, substance in our lives are much harder and and we kept keep on being sold these stories where it's like yeah, just shoot some people, that'll, that'll work it out.